Wayne Bastrop, and you're listening to The Movie Raid. It's time for the movie raid, and tonight's victim is actor Wayne Bastrop that played in Terminator Genesis, Sully, and with Tom Hanks in it, amongst many others. Hello. Hello, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, yeah, Sully, you know, that was uh, a couple of years ago now. Seems odd, because it seems like just yesterday. Funny how that stuff, but it works in your brain sometimes. But yeah, you know, Sully we did a couple of years ago and, and shot in, in New York City. Came back and, and finished it here in L.A. and got to work with Tom. I, I call him Tom like I know him, but I really don't. But he, he was a great guy. It was a lot of fun. So what have we been up to so far in terms of projects, uh, in terms of like uh, anything that's been recently released or anything that you're about to get out there within the couple months that you are allowed to say? Uh, I just did an episode of Angie Tribeca, and those episodes got released online uh, right before Christmas, or right after Christmas. I think it was December 29th. It was right before the end of the year. So those episodes are now streaming on TBS. I believe I'm in episode uh, number two, which is called Glitch Perfect, playing a Texas State Trooper. I don't know if you've ever watched Angie Tribeca, but it's, uh, it's a really funny show. You know, it was created and executive produced by Steve Carell and his wife. And as you know, he's got a wicked sense of humor. The writing is tremendous. You know, Rashida Jones is great. And in this season, we've got Bobby Cannavale, actually, who's uh, got an arc throughout uh, this season. So I got a great little scene with him. So if you get a chance, you know, go to TBS, check it out. Very nice, very nice. Now, when it comes to the television portion compared to film portion, I mean, do you think it's more let loose on being a character between television than film for yourself? Are you asking if there's a difference, really? Because yeah. It, yeah, you know, it's funny. I think these days, uh, the, you know, that line between TV and, and film has is, is really become sort of moot. Uh, it doesn't you know, really exist that much anymore. It's funny, I'm, I'm sort of halfway through the second season of The Handmaid's Tale right now. And I don't know if you've seen that, but it's just, it's like one of my favorite shows right now. It's amazing. It's just, it, it's incredible. And it's a TV show, but it, it's meant to be watched, you know, almost as a, as a film. And, and the acting and the pacing of that show is, is, is much more like a theatrical film than it would be television as you sort of generally think about it. And I think a lot of TV these days, especially streaming shows, are, are sort of uh, formatting their content that way. So it's it sort of feels more like a like a film rather than a TV show. But as far as my approach goes, you know, there really isn't that much difference as far as like a preparation in that sense. The thing that's it's different about TV and, and film really as an actor, sort of the pacing when you get there and you start the film. You know, TV shoots quickly. You know, they're on a much tighter schedule. And they're, you know, they've got episodes stacked on top of episodes and they need to get done with one, two, three, and four and, and so on at a certain amount of time. So, you know, a lot of time directors, producers and such, you know, you get hired for a show like that and they're not necessarily going to work with you or your character, per se, which is good and bad in a way because, you know, you get hired you go in and you, you do an audition and you get hired because of what you did in that audition. So they expect you to, to sort of bring that to you know, the character, to the show, and that's what they want to see. You know, film, film's a little bit different. It's certainly, you know, they take their time, the pacing's a lot slower, uh, the directors are much more involved with the actors rather than the sort of behind-the-scenes stuff. So you have an opportunity to do rehearsals, which you don't typically get to do in television, to explore the characters or their emotions sometimes in a particular scene. You get those opportunities more so in film, but you know, I don't think the preparation process is, is that much different from my end, really. It's sort of, you know, you, you get hired. And it's the same with film, you know, the, the director sees something in your audition that they like, and that's what they want to see you bring to the film on set. And if there's adjustments to be made, then they'll, they'll talk to you about that. So. Yeah, and when it comes to performing a character, do you think structuring an emotion before performing a, a character moment is, is actually a good method, like like preparation, like you mentioned? For me, no, not necessarily. I mean, you have to have an understanding of the scene and, you know, what's going on in the scene, you know? Is, is somebody just get shot? Is somebody getting married? You know, those just knowing what the scene is sort of informs what the emotion should be, typically. But I think, at least for myself, if you overthink an emotion, before you try to project that during filming, uh, I think comes off a little phony in a sense. You know, I'm more of the Meisner approach where, you know, you get in the scene with your partner and then you sort of see where it takes you. You know, there's, there's always this notion that you, you sort of have to, to think about crying or laughing or anything like that. And when you think of something on an academic level, like, oh, you know, at the funeral, I should be crying. Well, should you be? I don't know. I mean, a lot of people don't cry at funerals. A lot of people are very stoic and stuff like that. So if you try to sort of force or think about an emotion like that, it could come off as being forced. So typically, what I, you know, my approach is get there on set, see what uh, see what the other actors are doing, 
be what the director says, all that type of stuff. And then once the scene starts to go, you, you sort of essentially adapt to how it's unfolding. And that could be anything, really. You could laugh nervously when you're not supposed to, and it could come off brilliantly. I, I can't remember who said it, but it's the, the happy little accidents, you know, that come out while you're, while you're doing the film, you know, you, while you're filming and doing scene after scene. So that's more my approach when I sort of doing sort of preparation. I think if you think about it too much, you're going to trip yourself up. Well, I definitely agree because there are times like your character has actually been in, in the interrogation type of mode where your character is being interrogated by another character because you I mean anyone could really mess that area up because you're being talked to rather than you talking to the character because if, if someone's talking to you about a past moment of your character then it's anything can happen in that moment anything like you could probably overthink it you could probably forget that moment for that one second or, or anything in that parenting and it could either ruin or actually be a part of the character itself no, absolutely there are actors who say they can do this and study something for three months and and, and, and you know create a character in their head and then sort of reproduce that on film you know all this sort of characters emotions and everything but you know I, in, a, in a sense I, I still kind of find that a little sort of a stretch because ultimately you're bringing your own emotions to what's happening in a lot of ways and to say that a character cries here or he laughs here or he you know rolls his eyes here or something like that I think you're not really living in the moment while you're there filming and, and to me that's really the key I think when you live sort of in the moment that's when I think the authenticity and a performance comes out but if you're, if you're thinking about all this stuff what should the character do here before I shoot the scene I mean you're going to be thinking about that during filming and I've tried those methods before and they don't work because i got too much stuff going on in my head I'll forget my line or something I've got a speech and then maybe I shouldn't have done that because this character really is more of a tough guy I just don't it doesn't help me it, it trips me up more often than not yeah it could be a big distraction of because uh, some people can pull this off I mean they could just boom do the character right there off the spot just thinking about every little aspect of the character I mean sure there's nothing wrong with trying where the character is going before you do the moment or, but when once you get to that moment, now you're you're focusing on that, but then you lose focus on okay, where's the character supposed to be sitting? Where the character supposed to be walking? Like hand gestures or whatever, the body language. You're forgetting all about that. <laughs> right. No, exactly. There's some things you can do to sort of get into a mood and, and, and stay in that mood. Let's say you're doing a film, and the film is about a, a really depressed guy who got divorced. His life is just in ruins. And he's just sad all the time. That's, a, I think, a broad enough emotional sort of state to kind of, sort of, you know, build your foundation from. But, you know, I think if you get any more specific than that, I think that's when you start to sort of pick yourself up. You know, I'm going I'm to be kind of sad throughout this film. And you will be. But it's not to say that you're not going to have moments of a slight smile here that you're not expecting it or, you know, a chuckle or a laugh or, or whatever it, it might be because the scene sort of plays out that way. Yeah, and even sometimes the smallest thing that your character do or you yourself could do that isn't exactly a part of the character, like let's say you pause, like an awkward pause that's not really in between characters, like that kind of just, kill, to me, it kind of kills the moment there because you're like, okay, now what? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I know a lot of actors and I have a lot of actors' friends and, and everybody's got a philosophy. And, and I'm not one, I've never been one to sort of discourage anybody's you know, process. Everybody's got their own way of working and getting themselves to a place whatever that might be. I think that's great. And I've always found it suspicious. You know, you, you come down, you come to L.A., and, and there's all these schools of acting and all these teachers and coaches and everything, and everybody has the right answer, right? Wherever you go to, and it might be completely different for the next guy, but they've got the right answer to how it should be. And I just, it's, I don't think that's the case. I mean, nobody's got the right answer. I think it's, it's specific to, to each individual and, and, and how the artist really likes to work. And you can't tell Picasso to paint like Monet. That's not a style, right? You can't tell either one of them if they're wrong. Yeah, I mean, everybody's got their own method. I mean, sometimes you can't play it off as like, it almost seems like they're trying to instruct you, okay, this is how I want you to do it the way I did it. But I mean, that's not really, to me, it's not supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be, here, this is one way out of many ways how to act like this or move like that uh, or, or how to perform in a different way like other, like other people do, not they just want one straightforward type of method. Yeah, I mean, I think it, thinking how boring it would be if, if all actors prescribed to the same method, I think it would be really boring to watch people. Everybody's kind of doing the same thing. I mean, they've got the same process. I think what, what makes watching you know great films and TV shows and whatnot so exciting is, is the people, these individual actors that are unique in their own way. If you watch a Denzel Washington, you know, you watch a Jack Nicholson. You know, you can watch Jack Nicholson, and he's my favorite actor, by the way, that's why I say that. He's so unique. He's so unique, and you can put him into different roles, but he's always Jack Nicholson. That's what's so exciting. 
exciting to watch is, is him, really. He can play a different character, but he's just exciting to watch, and he's, he's completely different from any other actor. Has, I mean, we talked about Tom Hanks, and he's, he's a perfect example. The thing about Tom Hanks is what you see on the screen is, is exactly what he's like in real life, and I'm sure you've seen interviews with him. And he's the same way. When, when, you know, when I was on set around him, he's just a, he's a happy, jokey guy. I mean, he's exactly where he wants to be. You can tell he just loves his work. But what makes Tom Hanks so authentic is it's Tom Hanks. And when you see him doing characters, yes, he's being serious or he's being funny or he's being sad, but it's always it's always Tom Hanks, and that's what's so interesting about him. Playing roles, do you think, even if it's a minuscule role or small role or even a mid-sized role, do you think having to act big than what the role is is a, a good method as well? Hmm, good question. Well, no, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that at all. You know, maybe with your talking theater, that might work. If there's anything I've learned over the past 12 years is the less you do, uh, the more mileage you're going to get out of, of what you're trying to do. Because the thing about the camera is it, it exaggerates everything. A television camera, and now they're doing you know, 3D, IMAX cameras, everything in the high definition, everything you do, you know, every little facial twitch that you do when you're delivering a line or you're looking at somebody a certain way, that reads. And so the danger always pushing it too far, getting too big with it. I mean, it's a learning process, but you're sort of always adjusting yourself to that in a lot of ways. A good example, actually, is with the Angie Tribeca episode that's airing now. I, you know, Angie Tribeca is a, a satirical police drama. And if you watch it, it's, it's hilarious, but it's because it's just so outrageous. It's so crazy. You know, they just put these situations together. It, it reminds me of, like, The Naked Gun and stuff like that, essentially. But the thing that's great about, like, The Naked Gun or something is Leslie Wilson always plays this, this, this totally buttoned-up straight guy all the time. And that's what's so funny about it. He doesn't have to do anything big because the situations are crazy. And that's what it's like with this Angie Tribeca episode where we, we play these, I play this, you know, not, not too bright police officer. And if, if I went too big with it, it would just be too clowny. But trying to keep it grounded, just, just saying your lines and, and making a facial expression when it's warranted, it, it works because the situation is so crazy. You don't have to be crazy, the situation is. Yeah. And having to, uh, aside from like personal emotions into a character, do you think influence should be put aside uh, even you know trying to get that good role or to get the good results do you think it's best not to have uh, any real influence toward whatever character you're doing not at all i mean you, you need to bring all of that I mean, you you have to you're not a robot I, I know what it's like to cry i know what it's like to be sad and when you when you're crying and you're sad you're not thinking it you you are those things and so anytime that you can bring a personal experience into something i think is, is extremely helpful I think the key, though, again, is kind of going back to what we talked about in the very beginning, is, is not not thinking about it, not thinking that you need to be sad. In other words, if all of a sudden you're in this scene and you're three pages in this dialogue and something gets triggered in you where it's, you know, you want to laugh hysterically or, you know, the character says something and all of a sudden you're really sad and a tear falls down your face, I mean, that, that's what you're really looking for. You're looking for something in the scene of the dialogue to trigger that. Because if you think about it, then I think it comes off as funny. I'm, I'm going to cry at this moment. I am going to have a, a smirk at this moment. Well, it can be done, but I don't think it has the same impact. So, again, all those experiences, you know, we've all been angry, we've all been sad, we've all been happy, you know, all of that. You have to bring all of those things into any role you do. And again, when you, know, you talk about an actor like Tom Hanks, every time Tom Hanks laughs, He's not doing, maybe his character is laughing, but it's Tom Hanks laughing. You know what Tom Hanks, Tom Hanks sounds like when he laughs? He's not doing, he's not making up a laugh. It's Tom Hanks laughing. But he's doing it for the character, and it's authentic because it's him. And, and I think that's, you know, how a lot of these actors work, and, and, and that's sort of my approach again, too. You have to bring your own personality, because you can never, you never separate yourself from a character. I am this person. You, while you're always an H.E.O. Del Toro. You're always those people. Actors, everybody, every actor in the world wants to be a success in every role or basically anything in the film industry itself. Do you, do you think that sometimes the fear ex of excess can actually affect the ability of an actor? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think you can get too, I'm, I'm sure you could probably get too comfortable if you've made it this far. You take your foot off the accelerator a little bit. I think that's always a fear. Uh, there's a musician I read an interview about a few years back, and, and he said the same thing. And uh, you know, he said that he has now that he's made it, and uh, a well-known musician and a well-known band. He said, you know, the, the easy thing to do is to kind of sit back and, and enjoy the riches. But then at that point, you know, you're not really doing what you love anymore. You're just sort of coasting. And I think the same thing could be said. People that I've worked with, and I'm not going to name who they are, and somebody I worked with. Recently, 
recently on the show. He's a very, very well-known, very, very well-known actor. You know, this person, I could tell, they've had wild success throughout their career, but this person, they didn't want to be there. You know, they, I don't think they didn't need to be there. They, they had so much money, they've had so much success that I started to ask myself, oh, why is this person even going through this right now? Because they clearly are not enjoying themselves here. So I think that's always the danger if you get wildly successful like that. You know, maybe sometimes in your future I can be, I can reach that pinnacle. I, you dream of those cer- certain things. And, you know, my, my goal has never been to be famous. I didn't I didn't do this because I want to be famous. There are people, there are lots of people in Los Angeles who, you know, they, they come here to be famous, so that's their goal. That's not my goal. My goal is to be a good actor because I love, absolutely love doing it. There's nothing else that I can think of that I'd rather be doing because it allows me to basically play. You know, I get to play. When I was a kid, there's there two things I wanted to be when I was a kid. I wanted to be a carpenter or a stuntman. And I ended up being an architect and an actor. So that's close. But that's the great thing about being an actor. The only reason I wanted to be a stuntman because I was always out in the yard and it was, just, it was play. I was falling out of trees. I was getting shot by you know, bad guys. I mean, with my brother, and that's just, it's something I just love doing. I mean, it took me a long time to figure out that, that acting was a, was a viable career for me, because uh, I explored lots of other things, and, and I think in a lot of ways it helped me, because I sort of came around late to the understanding that that was really what I wanted to do, and I, you know, I, I managed to have uh, other careers, and did other things, because I had those life experiences, so I think it's helped me in a lot of ways, and, and if I do become wildly successful, I, I think that the fact that I did come to it late is going to you know, hopefully help my perspective. Well, go ahead and plug in anything that you want to, any current projects that you want to promote there, or anything that you're working with, or anything related. Yeah, well, I've got actually got two shows that are coming out uh, here in, in 2019. One is Are You Sleeping, which is an Apple TV series starring Octavia Spencer and Aaron Paul. I'm not sure when those episodes will be released. I, it's on Apple TV, and I don't think they even have a uh, streaming platform yet, it's, it's my understanding. You know, being who's in this show and, and knowing what they're putting into it, uh, I, I guarantee you it will, it will appear somewhere in the near future. And then uh, I've also got a great role in a new episodic called LA's Finals, uh, which again is streaming, I think it's an NBC or Spectrum, and that will be coming out in 2019. That's got uh, Jessica Alba, Gabby Union, um, who played in the Los Angeles Cops, and I've got a great role as a helicopter pilot in there. And I have a bad guy, and the whole episode revolves around my character, so it's fun. I think it's going to be a great show. And then, if it, I don't know, I've got a couple of uh, Frontier Communications uh, commercials airing currently as well, so you might catch my face if you watch TV. Um, I think those are nationally at the moment. And there you go. That is actor Wayne Estrup.